Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is uh, Mark Foreman. I am professor of philosophy and religion here at Liberty University. I've been here for about 26 years, um, and uh, it's a it's a really a privilege for, to be here tonight and to have been invited to to address you on this topic here. Um, I'm going to do more reading. I just. I can read better than, than just go off the cuff on this today, so if, I, uh, if you'll allow me to do that. Um, let me begin by thanking the seminary for this opportunity to speak with you tonight on the topic of truth in an age of skepticism. As a philosopher speaking to seminarians, I must admit I feel a bit out of place, kind of like Bill Clinton at a Ronald Reagan film festival. <clears throat> and. And knowing the title of my talk, I feel about as nervous as a cat with a long tail in a room full of rocking chairs. I also am dealing with the fact that I'm following Dr. Baggett's talk on sex with a talk on truth and skepticism. <laughs> I'm sure this may be a bit of a letdown for many of you. I understand that. However, I'm comforted by the feeling that I feel much more dis confident discussing my topic than I'm sure he felt discussing his. At least I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> By the way, David Baggett is my dearest friend. We're very, very dear friends. We rag each other all the time, and so. But he would probably agree with me, actually, on that one. <laughs> the title of my talk is going to be In Praise of Skepticism. I know this may come as a surprise to some of you, and you may already be thinking about getting a rope and performing a scene from that Henry Fonda classic, The Oxbow Incident. But like that mob, I think you might be reacting too quickly and harshly before you give me a chance to explain myself. Some of you may ask you your questions, what is praiseworthy about skepticism? This is a Christian university. We are about knowledge, knowing God, knowing the world that he has created. There's certainly no place for skepticism here. Well, I would like to suggest that I think there's a great value in skepticism, and I want to argue in favor of being skeptical. Let me start by saying that I think most, if not all, philosophers are skeptics at heart. I hope that philosophy majors might agree with me here, sitting here. In fact, it is our skepticism that drove us into this field. Philosophers by nature are not satisfied with simple answers to life's difficult questions or just adopting a view because that's what someone says or because everyone else holds it. We question everything, and when we arrive at conclusions, we are careful in subtly nuancing and qualifying the positions we almost always provisionally adopt. Disagreement doesn't really bother us very much. We're used to that. And skepticism plays a strong role in our approach to life. There are many advantages to skepticism. We don't worry about being abducted by aliens, running into Bigfoot or Elvis or the Loch Ness Monster. We don't worry about UFOs or finding the soundstage where the moon landing was filmed. Besides these issues, though, I think there are a number of benefits of adopting a skeptical attitude, and I would like to suggest some of these. First of all, skeptics are careful about arriving at conclusions. We want to make sure we are right before we arrive at a particular conclusion. So we carefully examine our evidence and our presuppositions and the manner in which arguments are stated. We carefully look for fallacies and errors in reasoning. We think about the language being used and how it might manipulate us to a conclusion. When we establish our conclusion, it is always carefully stated with appropriate qualification and nuancing and it's almost always provisional based on the evidence we have at hand. That's just the nature of what a skeptic does. Second of all, skeptics are open to new ideas. We are willing to hear out an individual's argument and consider reasonable alternatives. We often examine our own presuppositions and consider how they might be limiting us from considering a new and interesting view on an old problem. We avoid idolizing a long-held tradition purely for the sake of tradition or holding a view because that is what has always been believed. Third, skeptics are creative. We look for unconventional and creative solutions to problems that may not have been considered before. We allow our imagination to be set free to explore new possibilities and territory. We try to find resourceful and insightful new ways of combining ideas to solve old problems and issues. 
A fourth characteristic, skeptics employ good critical thinking skills. Skeptics understand the role that rhetoric and logic play in understanding, reasoning, and communicating ideas. They work hard to sharpen their skills in employing these tools precisely as they examine and evaluate the arguments of others and construct arguments of their own. Fifth, skeptics are open to being wrong. Because they are careful in arriving at conclusions, Skeptics are fallibilists when it comes to those conclusions. They are open to hearing the criticisms of others and to admitting their errors when shown and to adjusting their positions to correct those errors. They try to avoid the trap of arrogance and stubbornness. Disagreement does not bother them. And finally, a skeptical attitude can help reveal weaknesses in one's own presuppositions and arguments. It employs the virtue of epistemic humility and recognizes the limits of one's own knowledge and field of observation. All of the above benefits are part of a healthy skepticism. Of course, there are varieties of skepticism, and what I'm recommending here may not be what everyone thinks of when they think of skepticism. Historically, skepticism has taken many forms, but I will reduce them to basically considering three. First, there is the well-known school from ancient Grecian times known as Pyrrhonic skepticism, named for the skeptic Pyro. This form of skepticism came to be known as global skepticism. This form of skepticism denies that anyone knows about anything at all. It comes in two forms, the unmitigated form, which claims to know that no one knows anything, and the mitigated form, which claims to believe that no one knows anything. Of course, even the novice in philosophy can see the problem with the unmitigated form of skepticism. It's simply self-defeating to claim that I know that no one knows anything. We all kind of see that right away, and that stands up pretty clearly. However, some may not see the problem with the mitigated form of skepticism, the one that claims that I believe no one knows anything. Okay? It tries to make a softer claim to merely believe that no one knows anything to try and escape this self-defeating charge. However, one may, must then ask the unmitigated skeptic, well, do you know that you believe that no one knows anything? If he answers yes, well, then his claim is self-defeating, and he's in the same problem as the, the unmitigated skeptic. Okay? And if he answers no, well, then he ends up arguing for some sort of chain of infinite regress of knowledge, which, which doesn't have any foundation, which is, of course, just as problematic as a self-defeating position. So I think this form of skepticism, global skepticism, is certainly not something that any of us should adopt, and I would certainly argue against that. A second form of skepticism is called local skepticism. This is a more modest view that w which says that one can have knowledge of some areas, but there are other areas that one simply cannot claim to know. This is usually due to some limitation placed upon the criteria for knowledge. David Hume, the famous philosopher, British philosopher, took this view when he developed his famous Hume's fork. Knowledge consisted only of either matter of fact, which such as empirical observations, or relations of ideas, such as logical conclusions. He then famously proclaimed, quote, when we run over libraries persuaded of these principles, what havoc must we make? If we take in our hands any volume of divinity or school metaphysics, for instance, let us ask, does it contain any abstract reasoning concerning quality or number? No. Does it contain any experimental reasoning concerning matter of fact and existence? No. Commit it then to flames, for it can contain nothing but sophistry and illusion. And with that statement, of course, Hume took any metaphysical claims, any religious claims, and said, these cannot constitute knowledge. Knowledge can only about, be about matters of facts, things that I can empirically observe, or relations of ideas like mathematics or something like that. I le recently read an article by the scientist John Byrne, who stated that Hume's fork was a basic principle of science, declaring in the process, by the way, that only science can give us knowledge. The problem, of course, is that Hume's fork does not qualify as knowledge by its own standard, for it is neither a matter of fact or a relation of ideas. 
For that matter, neither is Hume's claim that only science provides knowledge. As it, is, is that a scientific claim? I guess they too must be committed to the flames. Their idea, the idea, of course, is that their ideas must be committed to flames, not them necessarily. Of course, this is another form of skepticism which I would disagree with and I would reject. A third form of skepticism is to use it as a tool for discovering truth. This would be called methodological skepticism. We see an example of it in the writings of Rene Descartes, who in his search for certainty, systematically doubted all of his knowledge until he arrived at the, at the one truth he could not doubt, his own existence, and his famous phrase, cogito ergo sum. Whatever one thinks of Descartes' project and his goal, both of which have serious problems and flaws, I think, I believe there is much value in adopting a skeptical methodology in searching for truth. And this is the skepticism I have in mind in listing the benefits that I've listed above. This form of skepticism does not deny that there is truth to be discovered. In fact, it fervently believes it is out there, just as Descartes fervently believed he could know something for certain. And it believes that we have the, faculty, the faculties to discover it and does not, nor should not, attempt to limit whatever faculties we might employ to discover truth, as Hume was doing with his fork or as scientists will do when they say you can only have knowledge through science. I don't think we should be limiting our criteria. I think we should be open to any criteria that might be able to offer knowledge to us. I want to advocate adopting a skeptical methodology and attitude in one's search for truth. One reason, besides the benefits I've suggested above, is that I see this as sorely lacking in our culture, especially in evangelical Christianity and in our students even here at Liberty. As a philosophy instructor here at Liberty University, I often battle student apathy and arrogance as they come into my class, thinking that they already know the truth about the basic questions of life and that there simply is no need to consider them and ponder the great questions and ideas of Western thought. I look out and I wonder how they can be so settled so early in life and to miss the joy of discovering answers for themselves rather than just adopting the beliefs that they have heard from others. It's not that they believe the wrong things. On the contrary, I think they believe much of what is true and what is good. It's that they have adopted a view, they have adopted a view rather than discovered and established it on their own. I find that disturbing, that bothers me that they do that. Hence, I often use skepticism as a way to shake them up, to rattle them out of their complacency and apathy and the, to get them to think about what they believe. In this sense, I think it's a great tool. A number of years ago, I had a student in one of my Philosophy 201 classes who was obviously frustrated over a long period of time by the way he reacted, all of a sudden bolt out of his chair in the middle of my lecture and at the top of his lungs say, why are we even talking about this stuff? Why do we even need to know this? The Bible tells us everything we're supposed to know. And he sat down and I said to him, well, how do you know that the Bible is true? Oh, well, of course we know the Bible is true. I mean, we just know that. And I said, well, I do believe that the Bible is true. I'm not denying the truthfulness of the Bible, but I think I've got good reasons to believe that it's true. Okay, now, I'm not just going to say that. Suppose a Muslim person comes along and says to me, well, I think the Koran is true. What would you say to him? Well, obviously he's wrong. Yeah, but why? Well, because he is. Well, I think we need to do more than that. I think we're required to do more than that. I think we're supposed to think these things through and have good reasons to support the things we believe. And I think a great way to start that journey off is to take a skeptical approach. Okay, what if the Bible wasn't true? Or how would I prove that it was true if it was, I was questioned that way? And kind of take that approach to it rather than just simply adopting it well because everybody tells me that. My pastor told me that and my teachers here at Liberty University tell me that and such like that. That's not the reason you should believe these things. Folks, I don't know about you, I would really be bothered. I would be very bothered if a student went out and said, well, I think this is the correct philosophical view because that's the view that Dr. Foreman holds. That would bother me. Okay? I don't want him to think that because I teach it. I want him to think it because he thinks it's true because he's got good reasons to think it's true. And that's what I think the skeptical attitude does. It helps us to do the job we need to do to go out and find the truth, discover truth on our own. 
Now, unlike the global skeptic, I do believe there's truth, and it is out there, so I should probably say a word about truth. One, uh, one can speak of truth from two perspectives, the ontological and the epistemological. There is the fact that a proposition is true or false, and that is a metaphysical or an ontological claim about reality. So the fact that a proposition is true is a metaphysical issue, is an ontological issue. It's true about reality, okay? Then there's the idea about whether we know a proposition is true, and that's an epistemological claim. So there's a difference we need to recognize right off the bat from a statement being true and knowing a statement is true. A statement being true is a, an ontological issue. A statement knowing a statement is true is an epistemological issue. Okay? In fact, the two main theories of truth depends on which of these two perspectives one leads towards. The correspondence theory states that a proposition is true if the proposition corresponds with the state of affairs in reality. Hence, the proposition, my car is blue, is true if, in fact, my car is blue. The coherence theory of truth leans towards the epistemological perspective and states that a proposition is true if that proposition coheres with other propositions we have come to accept as true. So the proposition, my car is blue, is true if it coheres with other beliefs that I have, like that I own a car, that I like blue things, that um, somebody else uh, told me that they like my blue car. It, it coheres with all those propositions, so therefore that's what makes the proposition, my car is blue, true. That's the coherence theory of truth. Well, I think there's much to be said for coherence. For example, I think a sign of falsehood is when a proposition does not cohere with other propositions we know to be true. I hold to the correspondence theory as being the superior understanding of what we mean when we say a proposition is true. Correspondence is what makes a proposition to be true, whether we know it or not. So I don't believe one necessarily has to know that a proposition is true in order for the proposition to be true. For example, I could say that there are 17,000 grubs living underneath the foundation of this building. I have no idea if that's true or not, but I do know one thing. It either is true or it is false. Okay, and that's what makes it true if there are 17,000 grubs living under side, under so, this, the underside of this particular building. This leads to my final point. In what way does the skeptical attitude help us in discovering the truth of reality? Well, I, best, I believe it best can be employed in developing the intellectual virtues. My favorite philosophers, Aristotle and Aquinas, extolled that the good life is one that is dominated and controlled by the virtues, of which there are two types, moral and intellectual. Now, for those of you who aren't aware of virtue thought or virtue theory and how we talk about that, just some quick background here. A virtue is a trained behavioral disposition to act in a positive manner. It's like a positive character trait. Virtues and vices are analogous to good and bad habits. If you think of a habit, it's something that you build into your personality through practice over time, something that you rarely think about or rarely act re and regularly act on. Well, that's what a virtue is. It's something you build into your life over time so that you regularly act on this particular way or it allows you, it supports you to act a particular way in a particular sense. We can do that morally and there are certainly good moral virtues like integrity and honesty and faithfulness and things like that. But there are also intellectual virtues. And I would like to suggest seven intellectual virtues for discovering truth. First of all, number one is simply a love of truth. It is this love of truth that drives an un undying intellectual curiosity to know and understand the deep things of God and his creation. Of course, like any virtue, an excess of the desires to know can become the vice of vicious curiosity, where our desire to know so controls us that we neglect other moral and epistemic duties. However, of greater concern to me is the opposite vice that has become rampant in modern Christian evangelicalism, anti-intellectualism. Some are almost proud of their lack of knowledge. Such an attitude, at least I believe, does not bring glory to God. For one is not loving the Lord with his entire mind when he refuses to use it to the best of his ability. The reasons for this spirit of anti-intellectualism are varied. Laziness, bad theology, bad exegesis are some of them. Many Christians are simply afraid of the truth. They're afraid that the truth might be something that's counter to God. But that's something, folks, we never have to be afraid of. Truth flows from God. 
if God exists and God has created the world, which I sincerely believe that he does, and by the way, I have very good reasons to believe that, okay, then I don't have to be afraid of the truth at all because the truth flows from him, okay? All truth is God's truth. But many fear that it will hinder their faith or cause doubt. Second of my intellectual virtues is diligence. Seeking the truth is hard work. It often takes many hours of reading and reflecting very hard on complex ideas. Diligence is the virtue of persistent and continuous industry to accomplish a task. It is simply the virtue of not quitting, even and especially when the desire to quit is overwhelming. The opposite vice is laziness. In our day, it is most evident to the overwhelming temptation to perform just the minimum amount of work necessary to get by instead of really seeking the truth. My third virtue is intellectual honesty. Philosopher Jay Wood says, quote, like so much of the virtuous life, seeking truth appropriately is a matter of seeking it in the right way for the right reason, using the right methods and for the right purposes. Honesty involves the means and the methods we employ in our search as well as the results. Many of us passionately hold on to our beliefs with firm commitments. Such passion might tempt us to skew our research and evidence in favor of the direction we want it to go rather than letting it point us in the direction of what is really true. It's easy to get blinded by our commitments and lose sight of our goal of finding the truth. However, any view that is arrived at through dishonest means is not going to provide us with truth and is not honoring to God. God is not glorified when we attempt to teach truth through deception. We live in a culture in which the maxim, it's easier to get forgiveness than permission, has become the new standard for morality. I think that's tragic. Number four, fairness and respect. We should treat others fairly and with respect. This virtue is unfortunately often in short supply among many Christians today. We live in a world of partisan politics where a white hat, black hat mentality has become all too pervasive. All who claim to be Christians are our friends and supporters and all who claim to be otherwise are the enemy. Those who hold beliefs that are different from ours and argue for those beliefs are not the enemy. Many of them are philosophers and thinkers who, like us, are on a journey to discover the truth. We might disagree, but we can still respect them for the work that they do and treat them in a fair and equitable manner. Good seekers of truth do not have a problem with disagreement. They mutually respect men and women of all beliefs and ideas. My fifth virtue, intellectual fortitude. Fortitude is a kind of courage, but it's different from plain bravery. Fortitude is the virtue that supports us when we need to overcome obstacles that arise in our journey. Think of the frontiersmen who, who, who um, uh, settled the West, all the obstacles they had to overcome as they continued through their journey. That's the idea of the virtue of fortitude. Fortitude is not the absence of fear. It is working through our fears to achieve a goal that we, to achieve a goal, excuse me, we know that the beliefs we often defend are not popular in the academia. The pressure to give in or to back off on one's beliefs can be enormous. Intellectual fortitude is a necessary virtue to maintain the faith in increasing opposition, for it is not easy to promote Christianity, especially as an unpopular view. My sixth virtue, epistemic humility. Epistemic humility is the virtue of recognizing that we are limited in our knowledge and in our ability to know. Sadly, in a desire to convey confidence in their beliefs, many Christians make claims that go far beyond what the evidence allows. They become arrogant and proud in their delusion of how much they think they know. Such individuals need a healthy dose of epistemic humility. The epistemically humble Christian offers his arguments unpretentiously, recognizing his own fallibility and is open to being shown where he might be wrong in his reasoning. He knows the difference between views of which he can be confident and those he holds with reservation. Above all, he knows the difference between confidence and arrogance and avoids the latter. 
Finally, my last virtue is teachability. The last virtue follows nicely on the tale of epistemic humility. Seekers of truth are teachable. They are open to learning from others. This involves all of the former virtues. Our out of our love of truth, you are willing to place yourself under the guidance of another. This involves epistemic humility. To have the intellectual honesty to admit a certain amount of ignorance takes fortitude. To be willing to listen and to learn from others, even from those with whom we might find some disagreement, takes respect. It involves hard work in understanding and in communicating with the teacher, which takes diligence. Jesus' disciples were teachable, and we need to model this virtue as well. Therefore, I recommend to you to adopt, an eth to adopt a method of skepticism as a way of discovering truth. Thank you for your time. Thank you, my brother, and I must say that we have been enlightened with your great erudition. Now I plan to baffle with bluster, uh, as uh, that seems to be my uh, strong suit. Uh, I do have to say this, that uh, I am much more at home uh, standing behind and opening the Bible and saying, open your Bibles too, uh, as is my uh, great privilege of being able to serve as a, a pastor in the local expression of the Bride of Christ. and. Uh, so this might find me playing a bit out of my uh, normal seat on the bus, but I do appreciate the opportunity and also uh, enjoy the role of being your backup dancer as you have been the, uh, the main act for the evening. But I do appreciate uh, your comments. Now just a quick word about what will follow in the, uh, in the uh, minutes to come. With regard to any great question from, this, uh, from those who would inhabit the stoa, uh, and might want to uh, nuance any of the uh, positions that I may misrepresent in caricature because that is part of my skill set. Uh, I will defer all questions to our uh, esteemed uh, scholar, uh, Dr. Foreman. But uh, so just know that I can tell you about uh, uh, West Side Barbell weightlifting philosophy, uh, creatine loading, as I'm finding out. <laughs> Should I have to make a hasty exit in the next few minutes, I will be back. Uh, for those of you who know about creatine loading, you know the challenge that I face right now. Um, and uh, caricature and misrepresentation, yes, that's my strong suit. But I do uh, appreciate given the opportunity. While I don't pretend to have any great expertise, I do have experience in preaching and teaching. That was the original uh, title of this particular talk, and apparently that title wasn't sexy enough to get you in here tonight, so we lopped off the preaching and teaching part, and I quickly found myself scrambling for some much small corner that I might be able to occupy. I did have the privilege of pastoring in Steamboat Springs, Colorado, and there, the, uh, on any given Sunday, you'll only find 6% of the population in any given church. My, that includes the Mormons, the, the JWs, the Christian scientists, I mean on and on. And for those of us who would actually claim the name of Jesus Christ and Lord and Savior would only be a small fraction of that 6%. So I do know what it is to preach and uh, teach in a skeptical environment where most of those that you come in contact on any given day would not hold our presuppositions uh, and many would find laughable the fact that we would try to advocate that there is truth to be known that goes beyond the mere perspectival uh, opinion of the individual person. So tonight, if I may, I'd like to address this truth in an age of skepticism and I'd like to offer an axiomatic approach. No fact of contemporary Western life is more evident than its growing distrust of final truth and implacable questioning of any sure word. The prevalent mood, as Langdon Gilkey Gilty wrote, is skeptical about all formulations of ultimate coherence or ultimate meaning, speculative as well as theological, and doubts the possibility of both philosophical knowing and religious faith. Carl Henry wrote those words in 1976, and they were the opening to his magnum opus, God, Revelation, and Authority. In this six-volume set, Henry would write what some would consider his prolegomena to a theological project. Oh, wait, it gets better. Uh, 
I have been able to preach and teach down a congregation before, too. That's another skill set I possess. <laughs> Is she in your class? Were you giving her extra credit? No, mine was done, and he figured that he'd heard all he needed. 500 points for everybody who stays, even if you're not in my class. Would consider the uh, opening to his theological project. Others would consider it an evangelical response to the skepticism that had grown out of Enlightenment epistemology that championed the content and truth claims of Orthodox Christianity. If those words were true in 1976, imagine what Henry would say of the situation now. Was not one of the hoped for consequences of the internet the removable, removal or at least diminishment of the skepticism that has abounded in modern Western life? I'll leave the required allusion to Al Gore and his role in the development of the Internet alone. In fact, it could be argued that there are those that, ha that have argued that with the Internet explosion, the unintended consequence is pervasive skepticism that we find now. In, Alan, in 1987, Alan Bloom, and you're all familiar with this, the closing of the American mind, wrote, there is one thing a professor can be absolutely certain of. Almost every student entering the university believes or says he believes that truth is relative. If this belief is put to the test, one can count on the student's reaction. They will be, this is no time for my uh, Kindle not to want to work. There we go. They will be uncomprehended with the question put to them. That anyone should regard the proposition as not self-evident astonishes them, as though they were calling into question 2 plus 2 equals 4. The, persuas the persuasive skepticism that the Internet provides us with has taken a toll on even those who claim that they believe in absolute truth. Josh McDowell reports that among young evangelicals, like those who attend this university, that the number that believe there is no truth apart from their own views has risen from 51% in 1991 to 91% today. When Pilate asked, what is truth, in John 18, 38, at least he was standing face to face with it. The skepticism that we face today has a long history and has become ingrained in the very fabric of the tapestry of Western life. Illustrative of this skepticism are the well-known examples of the six blind men, each describing the elephant, giving each perspective, and of course the three umpires as they articulate their views of truth, or balls and strikes. What seems often to be lost in the telling of the six blind men and their description of the ele elephant is the presence of the elephant. There is a real elephant to be known, and the presence of the omniscient narrator. With regard to the three umpires, they are said to represent a pre-modern view of truth. That seems a bit disparaging, does it not? A modern and a post-modern view of truth. You know how the story goes. The pre-modern umpire, there are balls and strikes. The modern umpire says, there are balls and strikes, and I call them as I see them. And then, of course, the post-modern umpire, he says, there are balls and strikes, and they ain't nothing till I call them. You'll find this in the book, Truth is Stranger Than It Used to Be. It seems that the point to be made here is that if you hold to a pre-modern view of truth, uh, a world that includes mind-independent existence of a visible world, as opposed to skepticism or solipsism, uh, that you hold a sweet and naive view, a modern uh, or a mind-dependent aspect of the world that reaches out to understand and comes to understanding of the mind-independent world, with the comment would be, you're still locked into an old epistemology that has long been proven to be antiquated. But the postmodern view, and it em which emphasizes the power of relationship, personalization, and discourse in the construction of truth and worldviews, is if they were saying, we've been waiting on you all along. Insert the condescending smile at that point by the postmodernists. But I do like what William Lane Craig has to say about this. In his interview with uh, Frank Turek, William Lane Craig says, or uh, in response to the question, uh, Turek asks, we have an ideal in our culture, I think generally, we think that everyone is postmodern, that they don't even believe in truth. And I've heard you say that you that before that you don't agree with this. Craig's response is, our culture remains deeply modernist at heart. Nobody is a postmodernist when it comes to reading the labels on a box of rat poison, a bottle of aspirin. If you get a headache, you better believe that the text has objective meaning. People are not relativistic and pluralistic about engineering, medicine, and technology. What they're relativistic and pluralistic about is ethics and religion. 
But that's not postmodernism. That's modernism. That's just old-time verificationism, which says if you can't prove it, prove it by the scientific method, it's merely a matter of personal taste and emotive expression. And the nerve of the response that has been struck by the new atheist, Craig says, I think is the most eloquent testimony of how deeply modernism remains in our culture. But if these postmodernists were correct, the writings of Dawkins and the other new atheists would fall just like water on a duck's back. Rather than receiving the reception that it has because they are totally modernist, verificationist, and scientific. So it is a great, great mistake to think that we live in a postmodern society and that the traditional canons of logic, evidence, and truth are no longer relevant. Nothing could be further from the truth. And so he ends his, I end his comment. To even posit the very notion of absolute truth puts one in a precarious position of being labeled naive, a bigot, or worst of all nowadays, intolerant, as it might apply to a variety of moral judgments that we might make. To these labels, we will return in a bit, but for the moment, let me lay out the path that I'd like to take tonight. As I argue for my thesis, and here it is, the Christian understanding of truth is superior and does not seek validation from secular theories. The secular view that I want to engage tonight is naturalism. There are other views that from a Christian approach could be termed secular, but tonight I just want to focus on one, and I pray that I will have a smidgen of epistemic humility as I have been justly rebuked in my arrogance and my hubris. Uh, my approach is, is what I hope to be charitable, humble, simple, but not simplistic of which I'm often prone to make those type of arguments. I want to define naturalism and its view of truth and discuss the necessary implication for a view of truth. Secondly, I'd like to do the same procedure for evangelical Christianity, as Henry defines it, and I'll touch on that in a moment. And a third, I'll make a suggestion or two as it relates to going forward. I have several partners in my conversation tonight that I'm going to share with you. Of course, there is Carl F.H. Henry, of which you can't be an intelligent uh, evangelical Christian and having not read all 3,000 pages of God, Revelation, and Authority. I remain defiant in my lack of humility in that statement. <laughs> a little bit of Ronald Nash, Sire, Pacino, Geisler, and of course, William Lane Craig, and throw in a little J.P. Moreland as you might be able to recognize him as I dumb down his comments. As I, as I said, I hope to be fair, and should any character or caricature or misrepresentation occur, two things that I'm fairly adept at, uh, the fault would be mine. So let's begin with a secular axiom. We live in the twilight of a great civilization amid the deepening decline of modern culture. And just as the Roman mob sat in the Colosseum amused by the various game, uh, games and entertainments provided by their rulers, we sit in front of our TV sets unmindful that similar distractions were used to distract the minds of the restless ones from the realities of a spiritually vagrant empire to the illusion that all is basically well. It seems that as long as our favorite reality show, our insert, sports team, pastor, and how disappointing they can be, praise team, author, etc., you insert the blank, is doing well, then all is well. Carl Henry wrote in 1998 that the Western world, that in the Western world, naturalism has become biblical theism's major competing conceptuality. Naturalism can be defined as the view of the world that takes account only of natural elements and forces, excluding the supernatural or spiritual. The belief that all phenomena are covered by the laws of science and that all teleological explanations are therefore without value. The main postulates are, there are five of them, the naturalistic worldview is declared alone to be credible and necessary. The inevitability of human progress is the second. Third, the inherent goodness of man. Fourth, the absolute uniformity of nature. And then fifth, the ultimate reality of nature. And let me just throw in this one as well, the ultimate animality of man, that man is an animal. In light of these postulates, those that hold this view allow for no alternative whatever to a naturalistic explanation for all of reality. That sounds rather dogmatic to me, but it is here and on this note that Henry provides a helpful critique. In the context of setting his forth his view of the method and criteria of theology, he writes this. 
it must of necessity declare any method must of necessity declare which method or methods of knowing it considers appropriate to the knowledge of God and what tests for truth it approves. When a non-Christian asks, what persuasive reasons have you for believing, the basic issue at stake is, is theology credible? Unless theology clearly identifies its way of knowing God and its criteria for verifying such knowledge claims, it, its future as a serious academic concern is problematical, and I think our brother has already touched on the uh, vacuousness that largely evangelicals have or are considered with regard to our answers for the ills that we face and even our positions. It seems to me that it's no less incumbent upon those that hold to naturalism and for that matter any number of the other isms that compete for worldview supremacy, that they elucidate their methods for knowing as well as their presuppositions. In stating the aforementioned elements of the naturalistic worldview, uh, Henry provides an exposition of these tenets and then highlights the overpromised and undelivered satisfactory explanatory hypothesis that the naturalistic view is said to provide. The question that arises then, does naturalism best account for the data of reality, human experience, and the topic of our discussion tonight, truth? Henry identifies four characteristics of naturalism that form the explanatory hypothesis for all of reality. They are comprehensive contingency, total transiency, radical relativity, and absolute autonomy. Let me unpack these just very quickly. Comprehensive contingency asserts that all reality is provisional and there's no transcendent dimension to life or to existence. To even posit such a possibly emergent dimension is relegated to man's psychic experience as symbols of imagination or illusion. Comprehensive contingency also asserts that the universe and man are not to be explained in terms of intelligible or purposive causes. There is no decisive reason for the universe, for man, no ultimate plan or design. Reality is inherently irrational. Nature is blind and history is unpredictable and chaotic. Comprehensive contingency has as one of its bylines, the universe is all that there is and all that there ever will be. Linked with comprehensive contingency is total transiency of all reality and experience. This assertion holds that temporal process is the essence of nature and history. Man is time bound. His historical localization imprisons him and he's unable to extricate himself from the prison and is hurled towards old age and death with no meaning. Just as a quick aside, Henry notes in response to a comment by Gilkey in Naming the Whirlwind, he says, science, which has more than anything else taught man his contingency and relativity in the world, has ironically led him to forget that contingency and relativity and to consider, to seriously consider himself to the, be the potential master of his fate. This development is the more bizarre when one recalls that the great philosophers of the past found in the doctrine of the ultimacy of change no basis whatever for optimism about human concerns. The third assertion is radical relati relativity. All truth is relative, as are values and events to their changing cultural context and historical situation. Man's total existence is held to be embedded in historical relativity, and all human phenomena are therefore evaluated in terms of natural processes. And then finally, the absolute autonomy of man is the final assertion. Man alone remains self-sufficient and autonomous and has the necessary tools of his own making to rescue the cosmos from absurdity and meaningless. Man does not need God a God or any number of gods to know truth or to know good. It is here that the problem of these four elements, comprehensive contingency, total transiency, radical relativity, and the autonomy of man, that for those who hold, the, hold those views, find themselves with a problem that they are incapable of solving. How does this man feel at home in a universe which, was, which is conceived as the chance result of statistical probabilities and which is said to have come into existence through an explosion. 
If Sagan was right, the universe is all that there is and all that there ever will be, where does this man find purpose and meaning in life? And yet, that exact, yet, and that is exactly what he does. And we'll come back to that in a moment. The secular man, as Carl Henry calls him, has an exuberant view of personal potential. In spite of the fact that this man bases his experience in a historical process that is relative, in a cosmic reality that is indifferent to human purposes and values, it's this man who lives and adjusts his life to norms and values that find no home in his system. We find this man valuing universal justice, duty to neighbor, self-giving, and a positive view of the earth as an object of ethical duty. What accounting is there that would exempt man from this simple verdict that based on his assertion of ultimate transiency and relativity, that this is just the way it is. Is it the case that all we are left with is the view that nothing plus no one plus time plus chance equals all that there is? If so, I am skeptical about a statement that addresses the possibility of knowing or not knowing, and even that particular statement. But I'd like to make my second argument and that is to propose the Christian alternative and put forth a Christian axiom. In light of the foregoing, do we have another alternative position that would deliver us from the empty cup that nothing plus no one plus time plus chance equals all that there is? And the answer is yes. Yes, we do. There are several options, but I would like to look at the alternative of biblical Christianity, as Carl Henry calls it, and, the rev and, and his view that the Christian revelation insists that human beings can know truth. He says we can know something fixed and final about God and about the human situation. The Christian world life view is diametrically opposed to the naturalistic worldview that is characterized by impersonal forces, chance, with the result that humanity is merely an animated confluence of, of space-time contingencies. Henry is clear and direct when he affirms, when he says, in affirming God's intelligible self-disclosure, the Christian view disputes the naturalistic option not simply in respect to isolated issues, but in its entirety. He says, we are self-deceived if we allow naturalistic speculation to parade as something modern, when in fact it was repudiated almost 2,500 years ago by the great philosophers of Greece. Pagan though they were, the classic Greek sages recognized that naturalism cannot bring into being or sustain a stable society and in fact robs human life of distinctive value and meaning. The Greeks insisted that if time and chance control all reality and if truth and right are subject to ongoing revision, then human civilization becomes impossible. Moreover, human life loses fixed meaning, and special worth. They found no basis for optimism in ultimate progress and change. It remained for modern evolutionists to argue for conversely that change means progress and that human history is headed for utopia. In this respect, secular philosophy borrowed the biblical doctrine of the coming of the kingdom of God, but cannibalized it. Naturalism's abandonment of unchanging truth and of a fixed good has resulted not in utopia, but in a relapse to paganism and barbarianism that increasingly corrupts modern life. And just to add just a smidget of depth to that, as Henry would write in The Drift of Western Thought, he says that th the thread that connected the heart of the Socratic, Platonic, and Aristotelian philosophy was the idealistic <coughs> rebuttal of naturalism. Henry writes that Greek idealism was consciously opposed to the naturalistic school as expressed by Democritus, who is picking up on the Heracletan flux uh, who lived in the Ephesus. And by the way, when you get a chance to go to Ephesus, it is just awesome. I was there this, sun, this summer. Fabulous. That's just as an aside. That was free tonight. <laughs> the classic philosophers realized that if Democritus went unchallenged, Greek culture was doomed. But why? What was it about Democritian naturalism that was such a threat? The idealists discerned that Democritus and sophistic philosophy offered no basis for a durable Greek culture. A universe in which everything is in flux is a universe that is unintelligible. And if unintelligible, there is no basis for morality and truth. And if there's no basis for morality and truth, then there's no basis for a stable society. 
So if Henry has summarized the situation accurately, where, what, where might we start in developing a Christian view of truth that is objective and leads man to know something fixed about God, his situation in the world around him? I can hear the collective groan now. Please, not the Bible. But before we turn there, after all, it's not Sunday, but Sunday is coming. <laughs> Let's start with an axiomatic approach of Christian axioms. Axioms are the ruling principles which any system of thought uh, begins. They are never deduced or inferred from other principles, but are simply presupposed. Logic itself rests on empirically unprovable principles. I realize there might be some that want to uh, debate me on that. Take it up with Dr. Foreman. That one must assume in every effort to communicate intelligibly, i.e. the principle of non-contradiction. So, passing over this, uh, my intended discussion, I want to get on to what I really want to, to what I want to get to, but we know that we need logic, the principles of logic, to even communicate, right? And without the law of non-contradiction, that nothing has any meaning. And then you can take the law of the included, uh, excluded middle and law of uh, identity as well. But so we're all in agreement that logic is necessary for you to even be to disagree with me. You would have to use the principle of law of non-contradiction. We're all together on that, right? I've even picked up on you doing that, right? Henry writes that throughout the long history, throughout its long history, philosophy has always recognized the legitimacy of assuming without proof of a philosophical axiom or a postulational principle as an initial basis of reason. I'm going to eventually get, and I'll quote him in a moment, Alvin Plantinga. But as a Christian, you are within your epistemic rights of starting with God. You don't have to capitulate to a naturalistic uh, foundation. You just don't have to. If we allow them to have their starting point, it's natural for them to allow us to have ours. But we then have to set forth the, our criteria of knowing, criteria of verification, and then my, my, my response is, let the best system win. So that's really, in a nutshell, where I'm going with this. Democritus never demonstrated that all substance consists of indivisible and imperceptibly small particles. He postulated the premise and attempted to explain all existence consistently in terms of it. Plato never demonstrated the independent existence of the invisible world of eternal ideas. He argued that all lesser existence participates in or mirrors them. He would likely have dismissed as a sophist anyone who deprived him of a hearing in the absence of empirical proof of the existence of the eternal ideas. Kant did not derive his transcendental forms of thought through his epistemic theory, which identified all knowledge as a joint product of sense content and a priori forms. Since a priori forms are not sense perceptible, Kant must have postulated them independent of any theory. There is no way the philosophical naturalist can prove the declared truth of his scientific worldview other than by relying on his own theory's assumptions. The Christian philosopher is under no intellectual compunction to accept rival premises. The non-Christian can object, cannot object that axioms of the Christian worldview and the notion of truth are derived from a source other than sense experience. Empiricism cannot empirically justify its governing premise. As already stated, Kant could not derive from sense experience information about innate forms of thought. And so to object to the Christian axiom, axioms while holding to non-Christian axioms is not consistent. If secularists exercise their privilege of basing their theorems on axioms, then so can Christians. Plantinga says the Christian philosopher is entirely within his epistemic rights in starting from a belief in God. He has the right to take the existence of God for granted and go on from there in his philosophical work, just as other philosophers take for granted the existence of the past, say, uh, the past or of other persons, or even the basic claims of contemporary physics. So Henry offers, without equivocation or hesitation, a distinctively Christian view of knowing and truth. Writing to Christian educators, he says, Christian educators must expound its way, Christian education must expound its way of knowing God and strenuously proclaim universally valid truth. It will survive as but a fading oddity in an academic world that questions its legitimacy and appropriateness if it does not do so. 
Greg Thornberry has done a wonderful job in summarizing Henry's position and really condenses it for us. And so I want to quote liberally from that, if I may. He says this, Henry espoused a Reformation-inspired voluntarism in the best sense of the term. You guys hold on to the best sense of the term. He stressed the absolute dependence of human knowledge upon divine disclosure, whether natural or particular. In other words, according to Henry, we know what we know because God wills both the possibility and the content of that knowledge. Henry came to these views early on in his theological career and never wavered. Defining the revelational claim, he says, in an all sense, not in a, in a sense, all knowledge may be viewed as revelational since meaning is not imposed upon things by the human knower alone, but rather is made possible because mankind and the universe are the work of a rational deity who fashioned an intelligible creation. Human knowledge is not a source of a knowledge to be contrasted with revelation, but is a means of comprehending revelation. Thus God, by his eminence, sustains the human knower, even in his moral and cognitive revolt, and without that divine preservation. Ironically enough, man could not even rebel against God, for he would not exist. Augustine, early in the Christian centuries, detected what was apply, implied in this conviction that human reason is not the creator of its own object, neither the external world or sensation, nor the internal world of ideas is rooted in subject, subjectivistic factors alone. Thus, God circumscribes and determines what can be known. The world remains knowable because God himself is an intelligent deity. Contrary to the trajectory of rationalism, no autonomous standard of reason can be offered since reason itself loses meaning apart from the divine character. Since the divine discloses himself as a person, revelation is personal in nature and can therefore speak to all of humanity. Consequently, revelation both coheres and corresponds to all reality because God is one. Henry declares only the fact that one sovereign God, the creator and Lord of all, stands at the center of divine disclosure guarantees a unified divine revelation. He has two axioms that he posits, an ontological and an epistemological one. The ontological axiom is the living self-revealed God, and the epistemological axiom is, the intellig is intelligible divine revelation. All essential doctrines of the Christian world life view flow from these axioms. Hicks summarizes Henry's central thesis is that God reveals and speak. God in his sovereign grace has chosen to do so and in doing so has made it where we can have an intelligible knowledge about the world in which we live and know something fixed about him and ourselves. So we really come to the proverbial fork in the road. As in any journey, a choice must be made. But the question always arises, which one? Well, the following question after that is, where do you want to go? In this journey, we've been exploring two courses that offer rival destinations as it points, as destination points as it relates to truth. The one course, naturalism, with the travel guides of nothing plus no one plus time plus chance equals all that there is, leaves me skeptical at best. At worst, I find myself as Sartre who describe the man who starts with these pre-commitments in such an agonizingly exquisite state of anguish. Listen to what he says in Existentialism and Human Emotions. God does not exist. Man is what he conceives himself to be. Man is nothing else but what he makes, uh, what, what we make, what me makes of himself, what we make of himself. Man is responsible for what he is, and he is responsible to make every man aware of what he is and to make the full responsibility of existence rest on him. His responsibility rests not only on himself, but also for all men. In choosing myself, I choose man. But if I am free to choose, whence comes anguish, forlornness, and despair? Sartre gives his answer. Existentialists say at once that man is in anguish. What that means is this. The man who involves himself and who realizes that he is not the only person he, he is not the only person he chooses to be, but he's also a lawmaker who is at the same time choosing all mankind as well as himself, cannot help escape the feeling of his total and deep responsibility. Of course, there are many people who are not anxious, but we claim that they are hiding their anxiety and they are fleeing from it. 
Certainly many people believe that when they do something, they themselves are the only ones involved. And when someone says to them, what if everyone acted that way? They shrug their shoulders and answer, everyone doesn't act that way. But really, one should always ask himself, what would happen if everybody looked at it that way? There's no escaping the disturbing thought except by a kind of double dealing. A man who lies and makes excuses for himself by saying not everybody does that is someone with an uneasy conscience because the act of lying implies that a universal value is conferred upon the lie. Anguish is evident when it conceals itself. This is the anguish that Kierkegaard called the anguish of Abraham. What proof? The voice from above. If it is I who consider the act a good or a bad one. Now, I'm not being singled out as an Abraham, and yet every moment I am obliged to perform exemplary acts. For every man, everything happens as if all mankind had his eyes fixed on him and were guiding itself by what he does. And every man ought to say to himself, am I really the kind of man who has the right to act in such a way that humanity might guide itself by my actions? And if he does not say that to himself, he is masking his anguish. When we speak of forlornness, we mean only that God does not exist, and we have to face all the consequences of this. This is very distressing that God does not exist because all possibility of finding values in, in the heavens of ideas disappear with him. There can no longer be an a priori good since there is no infinite and personal consciousness to think it. Everything is permissible if God does not exist, and as, as a result, man is forlorn because neither with him nor without does he find anything to cling to. And it's in that response that William Lane Craig develops his noble lie. I won't take time to, to read it in, in detail, but the essence of it is, as Henry posited earlier, in light of secular man's beginnings, there is no basis for the values that he clings to and so desperately wants to live by. Can you hear the anguish in Sartre? Nothing to cling to. He feels the weight of it. How else but would a responsible individual feel but anguish, forlornness, and despair? So what is our answer? We've come to the end of this part of our journey. Well, there are other parts to it, but for now we have the two paths that lie before us. The path that says nothing plus no one plus time plus chance equals all that there is. We can take that path, but Sartre has already ended his journey on that path and even as he was making it he described it in exquisite detail and the emotional punch of his quest still resonates with all who take the time to read and, and share that part of his journey with them you just feel the emptiness and the pain of it we can also embrace the noble eye and that encapsulates the futility of that path or we can take the other path the path that says God has been, is, and always will be. He has disclosed himself in a rational and intelligible way. All knowledge is in some sense revelational, and it is based in him. And even in an age of skepticism, we can know truth because truth has chosen to be known. Thank you.